Yes, my name is Ken Fleece, and uh, I live here in Egan, Minnesota, and uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer from 1962 to 1964, one of the first pioneer Peace Corps volunteers, and in Brazil, I was uh, stationed in north-central Brazil in a town called Corinchina in Bahia, which is about 250 miles northeast of where Brasilia is today, and Brasilia was uh, maybe four or five buildings in that day when I first visited Brazil in 1962. The one unique thing about our whole group is that we went to Brazil on uh, October 22nd, 1962, and that was the day of the Cuban Missile Blockade on a, uh, on a jet that was uh, a charter and it was not informed about the blockade and we actually ended up landing in Trinidad and spending a considerable amount of time there because they were going to send us on to India instead of on to South America because in Brazil they were having riots because they were uh, they had a military overthrow in 63 because in, at that time they were heavily leaning towards becoming a communist country so that was kind of the ominous start of our whole Peace Corps, but they sent us on and then rather than training in Brazil, we went to a very remote, isolated old dam site in the middle of uh, Brazil where there were no mattresses on the beds, and that's where we had our in-country training before they decided to move us on to villages in Brazil. Thank you. I'm Nora Highland, and I was Nora Dorman, and I lived in Brazil from 63 to 65 in the city of Piracicaba, Sao Paulo. Hello, I'm Carolyn Kinnick Rankin. I was in Brazil in 1963 to 65, working with 4-H clubs in Paraje, Minas, Belo Horizonte, Minas Gerais. I'm known by Rafi. Uh, I was in Brazil, 1964 to 1966 and it was a great experience. I still keep in touch with many people that I met in Brazil. I've gone back three times. My two daughters have gone back to visit the village I was in and the people that I was good friends with are now, no, my daughters, my two daughters. And I've gone back several times to visit with a priest, a person who was very important in my life there, his name is Frey Marcelino, and we still keep in touch. And so I've known him for 45 years, and he's 80 years old, and he left priesthood to marry. So he calls himself a married priest, not an ex-priest. And he's a real character. He, he got a PhD in education. He was a professor in the law in the school at the University of Paraíba. He got a law degree. He had he was elected to be a state assemblyman for Paraíba. And he's just a vivacious man who can do anything in the world. He brought water and electricity to our town, Catalina <laughs> de Rocha. So he's a memorable character that, that I'll always have in my heart. Okay. I'm Philip Letzinger. I served in the Peace Corps in Brazil from 1964 to 66. I guess one of the vivid memories is um, we had a student that worked at the university in our office, and um, I remember one evening we were um, going down the streets and uh, ended up at one of the uh, sidewalk uh, beer places, and um, he introduced me as um, his friend from the university, and I was one of the good Americans. So um, that was an interesting experience to uh, be introduced as an American, but as a good American, apparently they may have had some experience with some others uh, earlier on. My name is Victor Vic Cox. I was in Brazil from 64 to 66. I found the people there very hungry for ways in which to express themselves, ways in which to communicate. Um, community needs and I helped start a little mimeograph newspaper and one of the things that we did in this newspaper is I gave a page over to um, four young Brazilians in the, in the town who wanted to talk about the gossip that was going on. That quickly became the most read part of the newspaper and we came out about once every two or three weeks. <clears throat> and it also became the most controversial part. And there was a local shoemaker 
who ran a um, uh, what we called a, a loudspeaker system that broadcast religious music and his version of the local news and things like that. And after a certain amount of uh, local, local hard liquor, he would start criticizing the latest, the latest version of this uh, something they called the, uh, the gossip sheet, if you will, by the local unnamed moralistic angels. Okay, that was what their title was. And uh, this, this got to a point where he started saying, we really don't need any foreigners in this community. <laughs> you know, and, and it was really kind of interesting because he was an immigrant from the northeast part of Brazil. And then he started naming other northeasterners <laughs> that he didn't want to see in town anymore. <laughs> and uh, so, so one of the uh, moralistic angels came by my uh, hotel pension room I said, don't worry about this guy, he's just been having a little too much. But if you want me to, I'll go and beat him up. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I don't want that. We'll just play it cool, let it blow over. And it did. And uh, in fact, the moralistic angels uh, did accomplish a certain amount of interest in having a community newspaper. So before I left, I turned over everything that we had been able to build up through subscriptions and advertising to a Brazilian staff. I was the only Peace Corps volunteer in this town and I was the only English speaking person in the town too. But by the end of two years, which was my term of service, I had this assignment to go to another town and help teach new volunteers. So I said, okay, I want the paper to continue. I've been training a staff, you take over and you elect your, your editor in chief which they did. This editor-in-chief uh, lasted about a year and um, had many other activities, including trying to finish off his secondary education degree. And I felt like um, it was in good hands. And in the end, I got letters from him that said, okay, we elected a new, a new editor and he didn't want to use this mimeograph machine anymore. And for those of you, who don't know what a mimeograph machine is, go to Wikipedia and you'll find out. And uh, so he took all the savings and put it into having it printed in Campo Grande. And that lasted for about four issues, I think. And that exhausted all funds. And that was the end of the community newspaper. But the mimeograph machine stayed in the community and it was used for another school newspaper. So it kind of had a rebirth for at least a while. And that way, I think I kind of contributed to at least giving some people a chance to express themselves and to show them what the value is of having some kind of media. And that's my story. Fantastic, love it. <laughs> okay. What did last, I think, was the not only the friendships that I made, uh, some of whom, you know, I still think of very fondly today, and uh, <clears throat> who I went back to visit, like seven years after I had left the uh, community, and I could see the progress that had come to this small town in just those seven years. Since then, uh, my name is Pam Lopez. Um, I went to Brazil as a volunteer from 1964 to 66. I think we were Brazil 14 or something. I was stationed in Taguatinga, which is uh, one of the satellite cities of Brasilia. <clears throat> when we went back, uh, well, it was 13 years later, I believe, as co-directors of the Peace Corps, and we went to a hippie fair, which was like a crafts fair in the center of town. And um, I'd only been there a week. We'd been in Ecuador for almost two years, so my Portuguese had switched to Spanish. So then there we were back in Brazil, and I was having a horrible time trying to switch it back to Portuguese. Anyway, I went into the ladies' room, and this 
22 year old girl or something, you know, she looks at me and she says, Donna Pamela! You know? <laughs> and she was one of the little girls that had been in my little girls group. And she says, you look exactly the same! You know, and I looked at her and I'm thinking, you don't, you know, because <laughs> she was like 12. And she, and, but then I remembered who she was, and she was one who always had a cold, and she always had snot running down her face. <laughs> and she was beautiful now. She was this grown-up young woman, beautiful lady. I was so embarrassed, and I couldn't hardly talk to her, you know. <laughs> but that was funny. And then we did manage to track down some of the people I had worked with and get, we got a reunion going at our house one time. It took about a year though, because nobody lives in the same place anymore. And Like I went to where I had lived and that house was in the process of being torn down, the first house. And then I tried to find where I had moved to with the family and I thought I found the house, but I wasn't real sure. And we went, I was there with another ex -vol uh, volunteer who'd been there in the other part of town from us. And we went to this little tienda, you know, a little store that sells cigarettes and eggs and oil, and, you know, whatever little things you need. And asked about the family, and they said, no, 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 we don't know them, we don't know them. So we just hung around, and I think uh, my friend bought you know, one cigarette, which you can do there. And we talked a little bit more just between ourselves, talking about how we, about the family, you know, and they had one, I guess it was the, uh, it was a relative of theirs who was kind of distinctive person. So we talked about him. And then after a while, we went back and asked again, you know, are you sure you don't remember these people? <laughs> described them a little bit better. We knew their first names. I didn't even know their last name, I don't think. And finally they said, oh yeah, it's two blocks down, fourth house in, you know. <laughs> so, and they were still there, so we found them. Paul, I was stationed in Fortaleza, Serra, Brazil, um, 1964 to 1966. Uh, one of my most vivid memories was uh, when we had a polio epidemic in northeast Brazil and I went into the interior to help uh, vaccinate the children. Thank you. You're welcome.